Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to today's discussion on the role of masculinities in international security and peacekeeping, hosted by the Wilson Center and the Office of Global Women's Issues at the Department of State. I'm Sarah Barnes, and I direct the Maternal Health Initiative at the Wilson Center, where we focus on gender equity, health, and foreign policy. This event is co-sponsored by the Environmental Change and Security Program, which focuses on the intersections between climate, health, and security. Before we begin today, I wanted to just take a moment to recognize all of those who are suffering in Texas and around the country in the wake of yesterday's mass shooting at Rod Elementary School. Again, today we are discussing the role of masculinities in international security and peacekeeping. This discussion is both critical and timely. I'm honored to open this event today and I'm eager to engage in the discussion on gender, security, and peacekeeping. There is so much more people in decision-making and policy-making positions need to understand about the role of masculinities in global peacekeeping operations. The work of everyone in this discussion today is helping to achieve that goal, and I hope the conversation brings us one step closer to realizing it. Thank you to all of our panelists and our moderator for being here today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. To kick things off, it is my honor to introduce our first speaker, Abraham Denmark. Abe is currently the VP for Programs and Director of Studies at the Wilson Center. He's also a senior advisor to the Asia Program and senior fellow in the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. He is also one of the founding partners on the Wilson Center's Diversity and Inclusion Council, as well as was instrumental in the creation of the Wilson Center's Gender Inclusion Programming Policy. Prior to the Wilson Center, Abe served as De Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia. And before joining the Pentagon, Abe was a senior vice president at the National Bureau of Asian Research. Abe is currently at a conference with inconsistent connectivity, so is joining us by phone. Abe, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Um, as you'll notice, I am in a car uh, it's not even my car, it's a rental car, um, because I am currently in Omaha, Nebraska for a two-day conference at U.S. Strategic Command. Um, but I wanted to, it was very important to me to be able to support Sarah uh, and her work, uh, especially with this conference. So I'm currently in the parking lot, uh, which is really the only place where they'll let me be on a phone um, anywhere near to where my conference is. Um, so I appreciate your um, willingness to uh, put up with what may be a bad connection and is certainly not a very attractive background um, for a presentation. I appreciate your patience and understanding. Um, and I'm very pleased uh, to welcome such an esteemed panel to an important discussion on the role of men and masculinities in international security and peacekeeping. It's an honor for the Wilson Center to be hosting this event and I wanna start by thanking you, the event participants, uh, for making the time to participate in what I believe to be an incredibly timely and important discussion. More than 50 years ago, Congress established the Wilson Center for the purpose in their words of strengthening the fruitful relationship between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. Our programs span every region of the world and tackle today's most pressing challenges. While many centers deal in data and information, Congress asked us to go farther, to dig deeper, and to elevate scholarship and learning. Our moderator, our, our moderator today, Chantal de young Audrat, is currently a fellow at the Wilson Center working in, with the Mental Health Initiative and the Environmental Change and Security Program on gender and security and their linkages to conflict, human insecurity, and foreign policy. Chantal's work as a fellow is on men, masculinities, and security, and I look forward to learning more from the conversation she'll lead today. Um, also, Chantal, my wife, uh, tells me that my French is terrible, so I hope I didn't butcher the pronunciation of your name too badly. Uh, while global efforts aim to increase women's participation in peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building, uh, and, is, and it's making progress, women's involvement in these processes remain low and need sustained attention from international actors. In recent months, we've seen greater attention to the issue of gender equality and its essential importance to women and girls' full participation in social, economic, civic, and political life. The new national strategy on gender equity and equality reflects this, 
as do plans to implement the Women, Peace and Security or WPS strategy. These strategies lay important groundwork for coordinated, scaled up, whole of government approaches. The WPS agenda's four pillars of prevention, protection, participation, and relief and recovery all rely on engaging men to improve women's representation in peace building processes. It is therefore imperative to analyze the factors that shape masculinities and identify where men can play a positive role in promoting gender equity. In the, case, in the midst of ongoing crises, such as the rise of the Taliban in Afghanistan and the ongoing war in Ukraine, it is critical to recognize the importance of including women and promoting gender equality in ongoing conflict and post-conflict settings. We hope this conversation will shine a light on how ideas about masculinities define peacekeeping operations and more generally peace processes and mediation efforts and how these definitions can be at times problematic uh, to the ultimate objectives of peacekeeping. We hope to also collectively develop policy recommendations for both national and international actors on these issues. Uh, so I, to conclude, I'd like to thank the State Department's Office of Global Women's Issues for helping to bring this discussion to the Wilson Center and to senior official Kat Fotorvat. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your participation in your office's collaboration on this event. And of course, I wanted to recognize and thank Sarah Barnes for her leadership uh, with this event, but all, more broadly, on these issues at the Wilson Center, uh, which in her role has just been absolutely critical uh, to the center. I'm deeply uh, grateful for that. So panelists, uh, thank you all again for your participation in this discussion and uh, for your daily leadership on these critical issues. Thanks so much. Thank you, Abe. Um, thank you for kicking things off so strongly um, and best of luck to you as you return to your conference. Um, thanks so much. Um, and also a thank you to the Wilson Center leadership for taking on these important discussions. Also a quick thank you to my teammate, Dikshita Ramanarayanan from MHI and also our Wilson Center AV team for making this event possible. Without everyone uh, working on these things together, it would never come to be. Um, so thank you very much. Next up, we have senior official Katrina Fotovat. Uh, Kat is a senior official in the Office of Global Women's Issues at the Department of State where she leads a team of gender experts promoting gender equality efforts, including support of women, peace and security, countering violent extremism, promoting women's economic empowerment and combating gender-based violence. Kat has over 20 years of experience advocating for gender and human rights globally, specifically in conflict and post-conflict settings. Uh, Kat, I will turn things over to you. Welcome back to the Wilson Center. The floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you are joining us today. I would first of all like to thank all those who have taken the time to tune in today, the amazing panelists, and of course, the Wilson Center for their partnership on this event. In particular, Sarah, Chantel, and the rest of the amazing team coordinating this event. Our office was thrilled to partner with you for this event, and we look forward to future collaborations. I'd also like to thank you for your remarks, Abe, if he's still on in your car and that dedication. Um, in particular, your emphasis on the importance of this topic, including issues and strategies our office works closely on, such as the national gender strategy and through our WPS strategy, and pursuing a vital focus on masculinities as a role for improving the advancement of peace processes to be inclusive. As Sarah mentioned, I am the senior official for the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues, or SGWE, at the US Department of State. Our office oversees the integration of gender equity and equality across the U.S. Department of State and throughout U.S. foreign policy. I'm glad we are here today to discuss the impact, role, and importance of men and masculinities in peace processes. Too often, when discussing U.N. Security Council Resolution 1325 and Women, Peace, and Security, the role that men can play and should play as necessary allies, leaders, and actors in the space is neglected particularly with regards to the peace processes and mitigating conflict through supporting women leaders and coordinating peacekeeping efforts through a gendered lens. Additionally, missing from the broader conversation is the impact that masculinities can perpetuate violence through harmful gender stereotypes or alternatively promote peace by working through WPS initiatives to change the narrative, including how men effectively serve as champions for women's meaningful participation and leadership on peace and security contexts. For example, historically, the gendered consequences of violence have not been included in the narrative of conflict. Often when we say gender or discuss these issue sets, 
The default understanding is that we're talking about women and girls. What that understanding overlooks is the centrality of men and masculinities to our understanding of gender and gender dynamics. In order to effectively address the systemic exclusion of women from formal peace processes, we cannot only look at femininity and the essentialized expectations around it. We must also look at masculinity and the expectations on that identity and performance. By moving beyond women to focus on gender, we're able to understand and address the full range of the ways in which gender in its many forms informs peace and security processes and outcomes. As we have seen in recent conflicts around the world, such as in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Ukraine, conflict creates environments where there are disproportionate impacts on women and girls, including increased risk of gender-based violence. Through the forthcoming update to the US strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally, the United States government will lift up our commitment to preventing and responding to all forms of GBV, including conflict-related sexual violence. GBV is not only an unacceptable human rights abuse, it is also a significant barrier to women and girls engagement in peace and security processes. Women and girls experience insecurity and conflict in unique ways. For example, conflict can result in higher levels of gender-based violence, including arbitrary killings, torture, sexual violence, and forced marriage. As such, women and girls make equally unique contributions to addressing drivers of and mitigating conflict through gendered humanitarian aid, addressing gender-based violence in survivor-centered ways, and supporting communities. But women are consistently underrepresented in peace processes, or when they are not recognized by men who lead the peace efforts or are not included in decision-making roles. Peace processes and post-conflict reforms are an opportunity to transform societal structures and norms to bolster both women's rights and prevent a return to violence. Given their limited representation in peacemaking processes, women and girls cannot address the disproportionate impact of conflict on women and girls alone. A diverse coalition of like-minded champions, women, men, community leaders, activists, survivors, and international partners must be mobilized and recognized as an imperative to successful outcomes in peace processes. As we know, the fact that peace processes are 35% more likely to succeed and last when women are involved. This is not because women are inherently peaceful or better at peace than men. It is because we need diversity of thought and experience in order to meaningfully address the root causes of conflict and violence. Increasing women's engagement and participation in formal and peace and security processes isn't just better for women, it's better for everyone. However, that impact will only be effective if the peace table is comprised of all groups of people and experiences. By engaging with men as allies and partners of the WPS agenda and through collaboration with women and men's civil society leaders, diplomatic partners, we seek to promote better and more sustainable outcomes, not only for women, but entire communities and countries. Men and the role of masculinities must not only be understood and considered, but actively included and addressed throughout the peace processes when using a gendered framework. A more thorough understanding of men and masculinities will enable us to see how and why men often play gatekeeping roles that fail to prioritize the meaningful participation of women and girls and peacekeeping, and when and how men have advanced more inclusive process, processes and approaches. This understanding will enhance decisions, promote responsible stewardship, and inform tailored efforts to minimize rather than perpetuate the inequalities that drive conflict and block peace. This is vital. As patriarchal gender norms, including violent masculinities, are often one of the key drivers of conflict and instability. I look forward to hearing what David, Sabrina, and Grace all have to say. I'm sure it will be a unique and important discussion. Thank you again to the Wilson Center for your partnership on this event and your leadership on this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kat. Thank you for your comments and thank you for your participation and all of the work from you and your team, particularly Kayla McGill and Hannah Proctor for all the efforts related to bringing this um, discussion to the Wilson Center. Um, we too are looking very much forward to continuing to partner together in the future. Um, before I turn things over to our moderator, a few housekeeping items. For the audience, um, if you want to send questions to our 
panel, please email them to mhi at wilsoncenter.org. That stands for Maternal Health Initiative. So it's mhi at wilsoncenter.org. And then my colleague and I will be collecting those questions and I will come back later in the event to ask those, those questions directly to the panel. You can also follow along, um, follow the discussion on Twitter at Wilson underscore MHI using the hashtag men and peace. And so again, please submit questions. Um, our moderator Chantal will also remind you throughout the session to please submit those questions so we can make sure that the panelists are addressing the things that you think are most important um, related to these issues. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Chantal de Jean Audrat. Chantal is a global fellow with the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program and Maternal Health Initiative. She is also a member of the Board of Directors of Women in Inter International Security, or WISE, and was its president from 2013 until July 2021. Chantal's current work, as Abe mentioned, um, as a Wilson Center Fellow, is on men, masculinities, and international security. I cannot think of a better person to lead this discussion today. So thank you so much, Chantal, for all of your efforts and for being here today. And I turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you very much, uh, Kat, for your remarks. Uh, I think we have indeed today a stellar panel to talk about men, masculinities, and international security. And we will focus in our panel discussion on two issues, the relationship between masculinities and the women, peace and security agenda on the one hand, and then masculinities and peacekeeping on the other. Um, but let me introduce the panel that we have. Um, First is uh, David Dury Smith, who is a lecturer in gender and politics at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Sheffield. He is one of the foremost experts on masculinities and international security. Uh, his research has uh, focused on masculinities and peace building, uh, gender and uh, foreign fighter networks, uh, violent extremism, gender, uh, masculinities, and war. He has published extensively on these issues as well as feminist IR more generally. This is one of his books. Um, and he got his PhD from the University of Melbourne. Uh, second, we have Dr. Sabrina Karim. Uh, Sabrina Karim is the Hardy's Assistant Professor in the Department of Government at Cornell University, where she also directs the Gender and Security Lab. Her research focuses on conflict and peace processes, particularly state building in the aftermath of civil war, including gender and peacekeeping. Uh, she's done a lot of work on the WPS agenda, as well as on peacekeeping and policing, uh, has also published extensively on these issues. She is the author of an award-winning book, Equal Opportunity Peacekeeping, uh, Women, Peace and Security in Post-Conflict States. Um, Sabrina has been a long-standing member of the USIP Wise and University of Washington in St. Louis uh, Missing Peace Scholar Network, which is the network that looks at uh, conflict related sexual violence. And she got her PhD from Emory University. And last but certainly not least, uh, Grace Needy Rangu. She is a PhD student at the University of Witzwatersrand in South Africa and has worked for over 10 years uh, with urban refugees in Kenya and uh, Uganda. Her PhD focuses on the wartime sexual violence or the effects of wartime sexual violence on reproductive health of South Sudanese refugee women. Uh, Grace is a 2017 Women in International Next Generation Fellow and she was also a two, uh, 2016 USIP uh, Next Generation Change Fellow. Uh, like Sabrina, she is also a member of the 
uh, missing piece uh, scholar network on conflict related sexual violence and has published a number of policy briefs on uh, sexual and gender based violence, uh, both under the USMP umbrella as well as the WISE umbrella. Now we have all agreed that to make this really a conversation, we will address each other by our first names. Um, and uh, as I said in the beginning, um, we're going to focus on two issues, uh, one masculinities and the WPS agenda and second masculinities and peacekeeping. Uh, and please, uh, you know, submit any questions you have through the uh, email or by Twitter on using the at Wilson underscore M H I using the hashtag men and peace. And I think this is also, uh, these links are also put in the chat. So let us begin and uh, maybe let's just set the stage. Uh, when we talk about masculinities, um, what exactly do we mean with masculinities? And why is it important to talk about masculinities within the context of international security issues and the WPS agenda? I mean, after all, haven't men been uh, dominant in these international security issues, you know, for the since ever? So maybe, David, let me start with you. Why, what? What does masculinities mean and why is it so important to talk about masculinities? Thanks, Chantel. I mean, I think one of the challenges here is that people have a kind of inbuilt common sense understanding of what they think is gender and what they think is masculinity. So when they talk about masculinities in the WPS agenda, I think very often we can say, of course, I know what masculinities are. I've dealt with lots of men who are quite challenging to work with in this space, and I know what the problem is. But in practice, I think there are some quite contested understandings of what we're talking about here in terms of masculinities. The actual resolutions themselves tend to be quite euphemistic. They'll talk about engaging or enlisting men and boys in work on violence against women or about peace building in post-conflict situations. For me, as a scholar who works first on gender and masculinities and through that looking at conflict, I would tend to think of masculinities as the multiple, contested and relational ways in which men are expected to behave and do behave in different cultural contexts. For me, that would mean that in any given space, there are multiple models of what it means to be a man. In a military, you might think about this in terms of how are men involved in logistics behaving differently and to different standards to men involved in the infantry, to men involved in the Air Force or men involved in military police. There are gonna be some similarities there, but there are gonna be different expectations. More than that, I would argue that the masculinities are gonna look really different in different times and spaces. You can think about this in really personal terms, in terms of how did men in your grandfather's generation behave compared to men from your own cohort, but this looks really differently in different spaces, in terms of rural areas, cities. So we're thinking about the ways in which men are expected to behave, the ways in which they do behave, and how they define what it means to be a man in relation to, and importantly, in relation to other men, women, but also very often in relation to other men. Masculinities are as much defined in terms of what men think is a bad way to be a man as what they think is not manly at all. Thank you. Um, Grace, David said, you know, masculinities looks very differently in different spaces and, and in different times. So you work a lot in these refugee settings. How do you see the different types of masculinities play out in those settings? Thanks, Chantal. Um, I think just as David said that um, the concept of masculinities is different across different contexts and across different settings. And so when we look at masculinities in the refugee or even in the Kenyan context for that matter, we look at masculinities as the expectations that are set on men, either by society, by community, or even the people in their lives. 
And uh, in this case, we look at uh, masculinities in the traditional sense where men are seen as protectors, men are seen as providers, men are seen to be strong and should not show emotion. And so when they define themselves, when men look at themselves and uh, the expectations that they're expected to fulfill, they're seen as people who should be financially independent and uh, should have control of um, their finances and be able to provide for their family. And so in a context where a man is not able to fulfill those roles as a protector, as a provider for his family, then he begins to look at himself as less worth of a man or uh, looks at himself as a lesser man because he's not able to fulfill the expectations that has been uh, have been put on him as a man. Uh, we also see context uh, situations where when men are not able to live up to these expectations that have been placed on them, then they result to violence as a way of exerting their authority and dominance over the community, over the women, over the children in their lives, for example. And so this uh, goes on to perpetrate now violence and uh, it comes back to the whole idea that men are violent in nature. But then it's not that their nature is violent, but it's the inequalities and the structural expectations that have been put in place by society and the community that put them in this context where they result to violence because they're not living up to what has been uh, set out for them as a standard. Grace, uh, Sabrina, you've done a lot of research on uh, gender and peacekeeping, and we will talk more about that later on. Um, but for now, if you look at military uh, and police contingents, they are very male dominated spaces. And you've also said somewhere that uh, the military and police are gendered institutions in that they project and replicate structures of power that privilege men and certain forms of masculinities. And I wonder if you could uh, explain that, what you mean exactly by that. Great, um, thank you Chantal and thank you to the Wilson Center for this wonderful event. Um, I just uh, want to answer this question by talking about a little bit of research, um, uh, well, the main research that we're doing in the Gender and Security Sector Lab in coordination with the ELSI initiative and DCAF, the Geneva Center for Security Governance. Um, uh, so I was the lead researcher on something called the MOET methodology or the measuring opportunities for women in peacekeeping um, methodology to try to understand the barriers to women's meaningful participation in peacekeeping operations. And as a part of that, um, we have, ha, were able to conduct surveys of military personnel and police personnel in a number of countries, including Ghana, Zambia, Uruguay, Senegal, Bangladesh, Jordan, Norway, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and others. Um, and one of the things we are trying to understand is actually this question that Chantal has asked, um, is, is um, which we have developed kind of different measures to try to break apart different aspects of um, masculinity. So both um, Grace and David have spoken about how masculinity is contextual and how it's changing and it, it, it can um, it can be prompted or instigated by different um, things that are happening in a person's in a man's life. Um, and that's what we try to try, try to do in the survey is to try to um, kind of uh, instigate uh, two different ways in which this this masculinity might play out into violent beliefs. One is exactly what Grace mentioned, which is this idea of emasculation. So um, if a man feels like he cannot um, you know, fulfill his role as what is he is expected to be, he might feel emasculated. And, um, and it, so this is something that might happen in the security forces. Um, you know, different personnel might feel emasculated based off of what they're, in, what they're doing, um, et cetera. And, um, based on their role or in their, if they compare, compare their role to others in the security forces. So if a man is comparing himself to you know, a, a unit like a SWAT team or more of an operational unit, he might feel more emasculated because he's not in that hyper-masculine um, you know, unit, for example. The other mechanism that we measure is the opposite of that. It's possible that men uh, in the security forces might be more prone to violence because they're prompted to act in a hyper-masculine way. And um, this is kind of what Chantal mentioned that I talk about um, in the book, which is that security forces in general 
um, have to strip down the individual and basically create a, a hyper-masculine version, uh, you know, the most masculine version um, of what, uh, what it means to be a man just because they have to be socialized to be able to engage in violence because that's, that's the purpose. And so these two mechanisms, either being emasculated um, or engaging in hyper-masculinity, both might uh, result to um, personnel engaging in excess violence. So I'll just stop there. I think you're muted, Chantal. Oh, sorry. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Sabrina. And we'll come back to your research a little later. I do want to talk a little bit more about um, how do we connect the issue of men and masculinities to the WPS agenda? I mean, I think Kat has also mentioned it is important to engage uh, men as partners, as allies, uh, but that all, almost seems as if, you know, men are not really part of this issue, but they are supporters in a way. Uh, and then we've also talked a little bit, I think, in the resolutions, they talk about men as victims. My question is, have we addressed the issue of men and masculinities in the correct way? Should we do this differently? Um, and maybe let me start with you, David. Thanks, Chantel. I honestly think we've barely begun to work out the answer to this question. When I was doing interviews with people about efforts to, to integrate a masculinity's perspective into the WPS agenda, one of my participants said, we haven't engaged with masculinities in a meaningful way because that would mean questioning the foundations of the institutions that we build. It would lead to fundamental questioning of the security sector and how certain kinds of masculinity are celebrated by our partners. I think, unfortunately, for some of the early work on masculinities and the WPS, um, um, WPS agenda, it has resulted in a focus on a very narrow set of men as being the problem of having what some might call, although I, I don't like the term, toxic masculinity, and then bracketing off all the other masculinities as fine in this space. One of the participants for my research said that he had been asked by a country to develop a checkbox list on how to spot toxic masculinity based on what he saw as a stereotype about violent Congolese men who beat up their wives and daughters. In comparison, one of the other participants in my project said, you know, the problem is not just the young guy smoking a cigarette on the corner, it's my boss. And so when you talk to lots of people in the peace and security space, they will say there are issues with masculinities in a lot of different ways. There are issues with the masculinities of those involved in diplomacy, in bureaucratic work, in the aid sector, within militaries themselves, within insurgency groups, within civilian life. I think for me, where I would really begin with this is a bit of what Sabrina was talking about. Armed groups, including state armed groups and non-state armed groups, are often picking up on and exemplifying notions and expectations around masculinity that are very mainstream. Expectations for men to be able to violently defend themselves, to be aggressively heterosexual, to look after and provide for their family and community. And they, men in, in many contexts are told that if you fail to do these things, you are a failure as a man. And the way that you should respond to that is with violence and aggression. So while I think the WPS agenda has a very clear idea that there is a problem with lots of men's behavior, and I would argue that the messaging, the flashy kind of positive messaging around men as champions doesn't really get to that about, you know, who is doing all this violence to women? Who is excluding women? Who is creating these institutions? I don't think the messaging around champions does that. But I also don't think we've really done a very good job so far in capturing what is the heart of the problem. All too often it ends up getting externalized to a small group of racialized or marginalized poor men in the global South as being the men who don't know how to be men right. And then trying to say that all of the other forms of masculinity that are issues in our lives are not part of this conversation. Uh, very briefly, you said you don't like to use the word toxic masculinity. Uh, but it's a word that is being used very uh, frequently, uh, particularly, you know, within the popular literature. Why don't you like to use toxic masculinity? So 
most of those people who work on masculinities primarily would not use it. Toxic masculinity early on was used to talk about masculinities which are harmful to the men themselves who, who exhibit them. So men who engage in substance abuse, risk-taking behavior, self-destructive behavior. I can see the use of that. Where it gets used more commonly now is to kind of present the idea that masculinity is a continuum from less masculine to most masculine, and the problem is men who are most masculine. Most masculinity research would reject that because the idea is that masculinities are multiple competing models and that very often the men who are in, engaging in toxic masculinity are trying to participate in the same masculinity as men who aren't branded as toxic. It's just that, as Grace said, some men succeed in living up to gendered expectations and therefore don't engage in risk-taking or public violence because they're in political institutions, they're in business institutions, they're in religious institutions. And so toxic masculinity exceptionalizes and pathologizes an idea of what the problem with masculinity is, rather than what most of the literature on masculinity in conflict would say, which is that mainstream, mundane, everyday notions of masculinity are incredibly powerful in fueling conflict, violence and inequality. Thank you, David. I think that was important to uh, underscore Grace, how um, how do you see the integration of, of masculinities in men uh, within the WPS agenda? And how does that also in practice uh, could work on the ground? So um, when we talk about masculinities and the WPS agenda, uh, as David and you rightly put it, uh, the first way in which masculinities was integrated into the WPS agenda was through the involvement and engagement of men as champions. But then uh, this engagement was um, configured around what was called the good men in quotes, the men who seemed to support and who seemed to, um, to be uh, to stand up for the women in their community and in their lives. But then uh, what that has left out is that uh, when you talk about the good men, it, it embodies or they, they are the good men that have been modeled around what was seen to be a good man who is a supporter, who is a champion. Uh, but that has left the whole idea and uh, looking at what is militarized about masculinity, where men are expected to be violent and to dominate. But then we don't also look about uh, look at the gendered uh, norms that promote violence in the community and in the society. For example, when you look at communities that practice cattle wrestling and um, raiding uh, so that they can pay bright price, for example, it's not just about them being violent, but because they live in a society and a community where the expectation is that violence is ac acceptable for them to live up to the expectations that have been set for them in the society. Mm -hmm. So these men will go to any extent to raid at their neighboring community, for example, to get cut or to pay bride price. Because even the women in their lives, for example, support the whole idea of them being violent because any man who's not able to live up to that expectation is seen as a weaker man, as a man who's not living up to his expectations in the society. So when we look at integrating masculinities into the WPS agenda, we also have to look at those uh, gendered norms that have promoted militarized masculinity and begin to address those from the, uh, from the very foundation where they have been set. We cannot just work with engaging men, yet we have not addressed the root cause of the issue that has led to this notion of men being violent and dominant and has made, accept, uh, has made violence acceptable for certain men, for example, in certain communities. Thank you, Grace. Uh, Sabrina, any thoughts about how we can, how, or how we can or should better integrate men and masculinities in the WPS agenda? No, I think both uh, David and Grace have made very important points about uh, the role of masculinities being embedded in institutions. Um, but I, I, I will just add that I think um, if, if we're thinking about it from a policy perspective, I don't think that uh, masculinity um, has been integrated into the prevention and protection pillars as much as it could be. So if we think of you know uh, masculinities and um, violent masculinities being a cause of violence and conflict, 
then we would I, we, then it should fit under the prevention pillar of WPS because it is focusing on, um, uh, I guess, um, reducing the 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 more harmful um, aspects of masculinity would then be correlated with a reduction in conflict um, and violence. So that that is a direct there's a direct link in and um, if we're thinking of causes of violence in and in, in, in wanting to prevent violence and we absolutely have to include masculinities um, in that uh, reduction strategy. It is, similarly, it should also fall under the protection pillar um, because when we think of protection, mostly most of the time the policy around that has revolved around conflict related sexual violence um, and sexual violence in general. And again, there is a direct link between masculinities um, being violent <laughs> and and uh, wartime sexual violence. Um, I think we've you know both both Grace and David have, have demonstrated those links very clearly. Um, and so, if there is a policy angle for including toxic or sorry, including masculinities into the WPS agenda, there's a direct link through at least um, the prevention and protection pillars. Let me um, stay with you and, and let's move maybe towards uh, the issue of uh, peacekeeping because you mentioned conflict related sexual violence. Of course, one of the big problems in our peacekeeping operations, and I think the UN now has about 12 missions with about 90,000 people deployed. Uh, but one of the persistent problems with these peacekeeping operations has been the issue of sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, and as you mentioned, you did this survey, Sabrina, with the security forces uh, with the aim to uncover, you know, to what extent gender beliefs about masculinity and femininity or about gender more generally impact their behavior. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your research. What is it that have men engage in, uh, yeah, I would say bad behavior? <laughs> um, great, thank you, Chantal. Yes, yeah, so one of this is one of the main um, aspects we look at in, in the surveys we've done. Um, so I think the total number of surveys across these countries is over 3,000 personnel. Um, and we look at um, those personnel who have deployed to peacekeeping operations and those who have not. So we have um, kind of a representative sample across those who have deployed, as well as equal numbers of women personnel and, and male personnel. Um, and while there is a common belief that including more women in peacekeeping operations is supposed to decrease levels of sexual exploitation and abuse, um, my work shows that that is, is not the case. So including women, the more female peacekeepers you have um, does not lead to a reduction of sexual exploitation and abuse. And in fact, um, it, it actually has some negative consequences because it basically then places the burden of um, reporting uh, sexual exploitation abuse on women as opposed to men changing their behavior. Um, and so we should not place this expectation on the females that are deployed, but rather we should be focusing again on the men and masculinities that are potentially the root causes of some of this sexual exploitation and abuse on missions. So instead, what we do in the survey and what we find is um, we have a scale that we've developed on um, uh, people's and personnel's beliefs about gender stereotypes and a different scale on people's beliefs about hypermasculinity. And what's really interesting um, is that these two scales are actually not correlated with one another. So what, what does that mean? That means that if you hold um, gender stereotypes, so this belief that women can only do certain things and, and men can only do certain things, um, versus a more uh, versus beliefs about um, hypermasculinity, so you know beliefs that rape is acceptable, acceptable, etc. Those two things are not always correlated with one another. So people might have um, gender stereotypical beliefs, but they may not believe in kind of this um, hyper masculinity um, that can have negative uh, elements to it. What we find is that if you hold these kinds of beliefs, then you are much more likely to believe that sexual exploitation and, ab and abuse is acceptable. You're much less likely to report it to authorities. 
Um, and you're much less likely to believe that those people that engage in sexual exploitation and abuse should be punished. So the issue is not um, the sex of the personnel that are deployed. So it's not about female peacekeepers. And in fact, we find no correlation between female peacekeepers um, or female personnel and having um, beliefs about sexual exploitation abuse that are different um, than men. In fact, they hold the same 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 views. Um, but rather, it's about their the people's beliefs about gender stereotypes and their beliefs about masculinity that matter much more if we're interested in reducing any kind of misconduct, including sexual exploitation and abuse. So we should be focusing again on the masculinities and the gendered belief systems of personnel, not their sex. Any reactions, David, Grace? David? I mean, I think that that's that sounds entirely sensible. I think you see some similar things in terms of the movement into work on violent extremism within WPS, where women are responsibilized for men's um, involvement in violence and sort of trying to pass the burden onto them. I think this does just represent a broader issue in terms of policy responses sometimes in this space have looked for quick fix solutions to really entrenched notions of gender and gendered practices that are quite hard to unseat and that actually there needs to be a bit more of a foundational reworking in terms of some of these things if we're going to see real shifts in terms of perpetration of conflict related sexual violence as well as the wide range of other abuses that I would believe are, are quite closely linked to masculinity. Yeah, although I, if I may, I would uh, push back a little bit. Uh, we have seen, for instance, in the US military, in particular in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, when they introduce more women into the teams, the teams actually started to behaving better. And it's not because women were policing these men, but the men themselves felt that they had to behave better. So uh, I do think that the um, having more having a more diverse gender uh, representation within your unit does influence the behavior of the unit as a whole. Uh, Grace, and then I'll have another question for you. Uh, I just wanted to add that in terms of uh, peacekeeping missions and sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, we look at these uh, contributing countries uh, that contribute the troops to the missions. And uh, I think one of the issues that we might want to look at uh, in depth is the training because any troop that is going for this mission, uh, for example, is not, there's no country, for example, that uh, recruits uh, police and uh, people to join the military specific for uh, peacekeeping missions. They are all recruited and trained to be part of the military. And so it's the training uh, and what norms are perpetrated in those forms of uh, trainings that continue to perpetrate these gender stereotypes that men should be um, hyper-masculine, uh, that they should have this hyper-masculinity in terms of when they are especially engaging in conflict situations where they're supposed to be violent and dominant. And you look at uh, how they also handle, for example, excesses of power by uniformed forces in the countries where these troops are coming from. Uh, in most instances, for example, we have not had, uh, we have had uh, excesses of power not addressed and compensation to victims. Uh, it has been a long topic of discussion. For example, uh, I'll give a good example of the British Army that trains here in Kenya. Uh, there has been uh, reports of them raping women in the villages where they, tra they train and all these unexploded ordinances that they live. And there has been long conversations to uh, make the British army accountable and pay the victims, for example, but that hasn't happened to this day. So if we cannot uh, hold the troops accountable, for example, in the countries where they are working in within the boundaries where the mandate of the government is uh, to and the military has a mandate to hold these troops accountable, I think then it would be very difficult to hold them accountable when they're operating in a mandate that is not within their boundaries. And so uh, it all boils down to the kind of training that is offered to these troops, even before they deploy, for example, and how that can be tailored to now address these gender stereotypes and uh, begin to deconstruct the norms and 
stereotypes that have been indoctrinated in troops that make them uh, violent and dominant and want to perpetrate SEA when they go for these missions. Yeah, Grace, I think you you uh, touch on, on two important things and, and two important issues that have been used, I think, up until now, and that is both training and an emphasis on impunity or, or not allowing impunity, but having accountability. Uh, Sabrina, if indeed it is these belief systems that, you know, determine your behavior, which seems... Uh, you know, totally uh, uh, plausible and acceptable, um, then training would seem to be a very important thing to do. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Chantal. So uh, I will just respond to a, a few things um, that have been mentioned, including this idea of training. Um, First, Chantal, this point about you know the U.S. female engagement teams and and all female units, or just increasing numbers of women in peacekeeping operations in general. So I think there's a, a separate um, you know uh, reason to do that, which is just equality itself. But also there are some um, ways that the inclusion of women you know does enhance operational effectiveness, if you will, of peacekeeping operations, such as being able to access larger parts of the population. Also, um, for many countries, um, having all female units is a way for women to participate in the armed forces um, and, and police forces. Uh, so in a country like Bangladesh, where there's still taboo around men and women sharing barracks, for example, if there is an all female uh, unit, they can actually, it allows them to participate in peacekeeping operations. So, so there's lots of arguments um, aside from this idea that women um, uh, can somehow prevent misconduct. Uh, for why women should be deployed in the first place. So I just, I, I did want to agree with your point there, Chantel. Um, so with respect to training and impunity, uh, our research doesn't find that uh, gender training um, really changes people's opinions. In fact, it can on, on, sometimes even have um, the opposite approach, just, or the opposite um, reaction, because if you just think about, you know, the <laughs> the typical male, um, you know, mid-rebel colonel, let's say colonel rank, the last thing that he wants to do is attend another gender training, and they often don't, you know, pay attention and, and, and often have this, like, reaction that's pretty negative towards another gender training, another, another WPS training. So if you are going to try to, try to you know, change people's beliefs and, and um, social, uh, you know, socialize them differently. I don't think training is the answer, but you know, interestingly, what we do find in our research is that the experience of a deployment on a peacekeeping mission actually changes people's beliefs. So if you think about it, this is the first time that for many, uh, again, you know, uh, especially lower rank ranked soldiers and um, police officers where they have the opportunity to meet people from other countries and see how uh, things are done. To just to give an example of how this dynamic might work, um, I was once talking to a, um, a brigadier general in the Bangladeshi Armed Forces, and he asked me, well, this was in Liberia, um, you, know, you know, I've never really interacted with women before. Can you provide some guidance about how to do that? Because I, I don't know how to make friends with women. And, and so by having this experience of being on a peacekeeping mission where they're forced to interact with women or forced to you know, think about um, other norms and other value systems from other countries, they're, they're actually changing. Um, so having more international experiences that are not related to gender necessarily, so I'm thinking of exchange programs, um, other things where the exposure is there, but you're not forcing people to undergo this kind of um, forced training on, on gender. You're doing it subtly. It's happening just through experience. Um, so that that would be uh, the recommendation. I, I'll get to impunity later. <laughs> yeah, so basically what you're say, saying is uh, add a gender module and stir doesn't work. Uh, and I, I think that is uh, that is a point well taken. But you also seem to suggest that maybe if we change the way we train, we might actually get some results. Uh, David? I think this is a really complicated one. And I think we probably want to look to the literature on shifting masculinities and 
gender-based violence more broadly. I think there's a risk that we get stuck in the space of literature on um, conflict and security. There's a really large literature on shifting masculinities. And so I guess my overall point would be training in those kinds of direct interventions in relation to other gendered practices seems to be effective when you're trying to target a really specific practice a really specific kind of behavior and when that training is well designed so if you want to shift men's behavior in one very small way that that seems effective if the people want to change not if they're hostile to the whole initiative but there is a real challenge here in that very often men are not responding to just their own internalized ideas they are working within institutional contexts and community contexts that provide very material structural incentives to behave in certain ways that aren't just about their own sort of pathological ideas about how to be a man. They are rewarded for behaving in ways that embody violent masculinity. They are punished for failing to exhibit aggressive heterosexuality towards women, or they are punished for showing empathy, care, kindness, showing space for vulnerability. They are punished for a whole range of behaviors that we might want to produce. So I think I'm not against training. Um, there's been a lot of very interesting small group work from uh, different organizations involved with shifting masculinities, for example. And I'm not opposed to that work, but one of the participants in my field work in Fiji said to me, while I'm doing this work with kids in high school about shifting ideas around masculinity and violence, one of them said to him, you know, I want to be like these men in the military because they have a gun. And when they have a gun, people don't hurt them. People don't harm them. And he said to me, you know, the kid was right. The kid was right. If you are a young, marginalized Indigenous Fijian man in a rural community and you don't have access to economic wealth and you're not part of the military, you are vulnerable. And this is true in lots of situations of conflict. Men in the armed forces are vulnerable if they do not live up to these gendered expectations. And so we do need training, but there also needs to be some real top-down shifts in terms of who is making the calls, who is setting the culture. And I think that this is like all cultural change, something that's complex and needs to happen from multiple points at the same time. It needs to change who's in the room, who makes the calls, who gets trained, who gets rewarded, who gets promoted. And that is a, a challenging thing. Um, but I, I don't think that training shouldn't be part of that picture, but I think the challenge is when it's viewed as the answer. Uh, very well taken your point. Sabrina, you wanted to say a, a few words about impunity? Uh, sure, I can just very quickly. Um, so one of the things that's lauded is the UN zero tolerance policy on sexual exploitation and abuse. And um, I have some actually very interesting new research that shows that that might actually be harmful. Um, a, a harmful approach, like a, a, a no sex approach might actually be harmful because um, what that does, what we found from these surveys and interviews um, with female personnel, is that that shifts the uh, violence from um, between peacekeepers to the community to peacekeeper on peacekeeper uh, violence, because that zero tolerance policy does not cover peacekeeper on peacekeeper violence or, or uh, violence within units. And so if, um, if some people feel like they can't uh, get sex, if you will, um, through from the community for the cheap. They will try to get it from their female counterparts in the mission. Um, and so that's been um, an issue, as well as um, policies that are very extreme. So some military, uh, some countries have taken very extreme policies to ensure the zero tolerance. So they, they have very strict segregation policies. So very little interaction with the community, very little interaction between men and women in general in, in the peacekeeping um, uh, unit. So there can be some negative consequences of the zero tolerance policy as well. So that was just my point on um, impunity. Well, that's a very provocative uh, finding and I would find the potential policy recommendation uh, very provocative too. Uh, Grace, do you have a comment on this issue? Yeah, I, I, I was just listening to Sabrina, she talked about the zero tolerance mm -hmm. to, uh, to impunity. And I'm just thinking about, um, and uh, she makes a very good point in terms of that if the peacekeepers can't uh, engage in intimate uh, relationships with the community, then it will come back to the female 
uh, to the female personnel within the peacekeeping missions. And uh, I think that also uh, comes back to the issue of um, addressing these impunities and indiscrepancies that are undertaken by peacekeepers when they are on missions. I think uh, the biggest issue with um, addressing the issue, uh, the indiscipline by the peacekeepers has been that it's always been taken back to the uh, contributing countries. And uh, that in itself has been a challenge because once a peacekeeper who has, for example, violated a woman in the uh, mission where he was for, uh, is taken back to their country, there's little or no push and effort for him to be accountable for what he did. But also it, it thrills the community that they were serving. Remember, these are communities that have already been, uh, they have already been touched by conflict in manners that make them very vulnerable. And uh, they have interacted with armed groups and armed forces in manners that uh, made them fearful of anyone in uniform, for example. So this person in a blue helmet was uh, supposed to keep them uh, safe and is the one who's perpetrating the violence. So it, it reduces the legitimacy of the peacekeeping missions. And when the community does not see justice being served for those who have had to go through such experiences, for example, then it reduces their confidence uh, in these uh, soldiers who are supposed to be keeping them safe. And so even the introduction of women and um, having uh, women at the forefront of peacekeeping missions does not help. So I would say uh, maybe there needs to be uh, to, uh, discussions in terms of that, uh, the policies that uh, look at the zero tolerance on uh, SEA and look at how that can be addressed so that we uh, don't reduce the legitimacy of the peacekeeping missions and erode the confidence of communities that have been affected by conflict. Yes, yeah, so, so can I, can I come in on yeah, this please, Isabel? David. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an interesting finding from um, Alison Towns and Gareth Terry in relation to men's bonding relationships uh, in, in civilian life with this. They did some work on groups of men in New Zealand who'd been given messaging about um, intimate partner violence and about the, the problems with it. And what they found was in that context, it made the men less likely to call out their male friends because they'd been given messaging about how intimate partner violence was really bad and it was something that was very problematic, which I, I absolutely agree with. But what the men took away from this was it would be a real betrayal for me to accuse someone like my friend who is a good man, I know he's a good man, he's my friend, that he could have possibly done this. And so I think there is some real challenges in that we need really good empirical work, not just on not just on what the problems are, but about whether our interventions work in shifting practices. I think very often there's been a tendency to do um, monitoring and evaluation of gender work with men, which simply looks at men's attitudes before and after an intervention and hasn't done really holistic work about has this shifted men's practices. And when it comes to that, that work on impunity, I think there are some, some kind of dangers here in, in terms of, do we really know yet what is going to make men shift practices more broadly? And I think that's, that's, a, that's a tough question in terms of how to resolve it. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point. I, I would also say we have to be really careful that we're not essentializing men's behavior. You know, like the poor men, you know, he can't go six months without sex. Um, and but oftentimes we we fall back on those essentialized uh, notions and that, you know, also cuts off uh, potential other avenues. I want before I go to Sarah, I want all three of you to um, come with a few sort of concrete policy recommendations things that if you were sitting in the global women's office right now and they would say you know give me a policy on men and masculinities what are the top one or two things that you would say uh, they should undertake uh, sabrina let me start with you uh, okay, well, um, it's actually, uh, I'll just um, answer that by addressing a couple points that I wanted to tack on to this conversation we were just having. Um, so I just want to say that it's, it's, you know, it's not always about men needing sex, um, but rather that it's about relationships and, and, and men's emotions on, while on peacekeeping missions. So they miss not 
just the sex part, but really like actually having uh, human connections and relationships because they're missing their family. And, you know, one of the, the, the largest um, uh, problems that peacekeepers face is homesickness. And that's the same for men and women. Um, so oftentimes, you know, we, we, we think of sex, SEA and sex, but it's really about um, the relationship. And so that would be a recommendation is, is to think about the fact that anybody who is deployed, whether man or woman, um, that we, by attributing these stereotypes, you know, femininity onto women and, and masculinity onto men, we're missing the fact that men might have these feminine needs of a relationship and, you know, and, and vice versa. And so incorporating this um, ways to, you know, keep in touch with your family or this relationship aspect to peacekeeping would be, I think, a, a recommendation um, just for peacekeeping operations. Another one is has to do with um, naming and shaming and, and this idea of impunity. So we did not know which peacekeepers were engaging in sexual exploitation and abuse until 2015. Um, when the US, um, the US government and its foreign policy really pushed the UNDPKO to actually publicize the, the countries. And we have some research showing that that actually has, has, has led to a decrease, at least in the number of reports. Um, so when countries are called out for engaging in sexual exploitation abuse, their peacekeepers, they, there is actually changes that happen. Um, and, and we do see kind of a potential reduction in sexual exploitation abuse. So continuing to do um, this kind of naming and shaming uh, will force countries to take some kind of action as Grace was talking about. Um, and then finally, I would just say, you know, we really do need to incorporate masculinity into the WPS agenda, um, but, but not just in the WPS agenda, any kind of security sector reform um, that's going on. So what any police assistance programs or military assistance programs really need to think about the kinds of masculinity that they are exporting um, and creating through these, these kind of, um, uh, you know, training and um, training and equipping programs that the U.S. has and, and that the U.N. has. That's it. Thank you. Grace? Sure. Um, so I think one of my recommendations would be looking at the gender drivers of conflict, uh, those that promote conflict uh, and those that promote peace as well, because that uh, is critical in terms of addressing conflict prevention, and also looking at the relationships between uh, conflict, uh, between uh, masculinities and militarization in terms of peace and security, and how those uh, findings can then translate into policy in terms of uh, addressing prevention of conflict and uh, promotion of peace. Um, thanks. I'm going to give, go for three. My first one would be, if you have a program, and that's in peace and conflict, and your program doesn't focus on women, it focuses on men, congratulations, you've got a masculinity program, you just don't realise it yet. So I would say a review of all the initiatives that are being undertaken. If there are any initiatives which are working exclusively with men, especially to shift men's relationship with violence, the economy or authority, as the majority of peace building programs do and ignore women, that is a masculinity program and they need to think about that in terms of masculinity. Number two, when we talk about masculinity in relation to contexts of violence and peace and security, we often talk only in terms of harms, violence, aggression. These are all important things. But I would argue that the research says that often components like joy, intimacy, leisure, care for peers are mobilized to produce violence in very complex ways. So attention to the ways in which masculinities positive emotions, men's love for their male peers, men's sense of belonging, men's pleasure of being in spaces of excitement leads to violence. Third, and this is one we haven't talked about much today, but it's really not been on the radar enough, the work on masculinities in WPS is tremendously heteronormative. And the work from um, Jamie Hagen in this space has been really powerful all the time, especially the work on positive masculinities will send out messages like, to be a real man, you need to do A, B, and C towards your girlfriend and wife. At every step when we're trying to harm, to, to undermine patriarchal masculinities, we are reinforcing homophobia and transphobia in the way that we think about gender. So I think there needs to be a whole lot of work in terms of 
how ideas around heteronormativity and cisnormativity are baked into the way that we address masculinities. So that would be my three. Thank you very much. Uh, I think your point is well taken. And I know that Grace has uh, encountered a lot of that also on the ground and how detrimental that is. I want to go to Sarah. Sarah, uh, do you have some uh, comments from the audience? Yes, yes, I have plenty um, to keep us busy for the next 20 minutes. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of you. This is an incredible conversation and one that we will have to continue past today. Um, I've definitely learned a lot myself. Um, and you have touched on some of these questions from the audience, but I am keeping them in here so we can kind of dive in a little bit deeper. I'm gonna give two at a time. I have six in total right now. If you do have an urgent question and you're watching right now, you can send a question to mhi at wilsoncenter.org. Um, so th these are general questions to the group. The first is if someone from the panel can speak more to how, and David, I think you addressed this in your some of your comments, but if you can speak more to how masculine norms impact how male political leaders behave, um, how does the quote strong man male leader archetype reflect the masculine gender norms and how do they intersect with expectations for how leaders behave themselves? So that's one big question. The second one actually, David, you also were just mentioning, but I think others have also um, spoken some of this on some of this and I think we definitely would like to dive a bit deeper and that is the question of LGBTQI plus persons face a high risk of experiencing gender-based violence as a result of harmful masculinities but are not explicitly included in global gender equity agreements. How can global peacekeeping efforts ensure that LGBTQ plus people are included in the WPS agenda and other discussions on peace and security? So those are the first two big questions. Um, and I'll just open up the floor and Chantal, you too, um, any of you wanna jump in and answer pieces of those questions, please unmute and jump in. Um. David, do you want to take the one on the masculine norms and the male leaders? Sure. I would say the way in which masculinity impacts male leaders is often hidden because it doesn't manifest in terms of like that Rambo-esque violence, but it is really important. Very often the way in which male leaders are socialized to be dominating, not to listen, not to be empathetic, not to care about women's experiences, definitely not to care about queer people's experiences, has shaped the peace and security sector immensely. Often that gets hidden because they manifest masculinity through technical expertise, rhetorical strength and skill, rather than the more overt and, and uh, marginalised versions of masculinity that we often see coming up in the literature. I would say in terms of how it comes up in the WPS space. Lots of people I interviewed talked about how male leaders would give verbal commitments to women's equality and to gender equality, but in practice, they would not do the work. They would want to get the accolades for saying they were a good, good bloke and, and being an ally. But when it came to, for example, giving up space or giving money or, or choosing priorities, it didn't pay off. So there are a couple of my thoughts on that one. Yeah. Great. No, thank you. That's really helpful. I don't know, Grace, I know I think that it was, oh, go ahead, Chantal, did you want to say something? Yeah, no, maybe Grace on the L LGBTQ yeah. issues. I mean, I think you, you've you dealing, you're dealing with a lot with that in the refugee situations as well. Yeah, um, so uh, part of uh, the reason why we see this uh, happen in the peace and security is mainly because of the gender stereotyping around uh, violence, especially towards men and uh, the homophobia. And David touched on it uh, towards uh, when he was making his recommendations. The homophobia and uh, attitudes toward, uh, homo uh, towards LGBTQ men and LGBTQ plus persons. And so these gender stereotypes make it hard even for men to report violence and especially sexual violence, especially in countries where same-sex conduct is criminalized and where there are uh, homophobic attitudes either by service providers and even by agency staff where these uh, who are the first persons of contact with these refugees and people fleeing conflict, for example. So I think in terms of inclusion into the peace and security agenda, we need to first address uh, these gender stereotypes that make it hard for them to report these issues. And most importantly, because these gender stereotypes then um, 
continue to perpetrate the whole narrative that and what the, the whole conversation that we were talking about that men are supposed to, the expectations of men basically and what we've seen uh, in terms of uh, the gender stereotyping towards lgbtq plus persons is that uh, anytime for example a gay man will go to report that they have been sexually violated there's always that question by uh, and i've had a lot of uh, lgbtq clans say that the service providers looked at me and said it looks like you had been engaging in uh, same sex. So how do we know that this was not consensual, for example? And so that reduces and it takes away from the fact that they were violated, it was not consensual. And the other thing has been that uh, when you look at um, the same sex conduct criminalization in most countries, for example, in Africa, it makes it difficult even for the police to, re uh, to record these cases and even follow up for uh, justice for these survivors and uh, that has always uh, been reduced and demeaned the fact that these people have, have have gone through something that is very traumatizing for example and something that has taken away from their dignity but then uh, the people who are supposed to be protecting them are the same persons who are re-traumatizing them by throwing it back into their faces that you you looked for this you welcomed this I've had a client who said that the moment the doctor examined him and uh, so that he had, um, this was a client who was gay and was suffering from uh, a condition. Uh, he, he had an STI that he ha that had manifested uh, previously and had been untreated. And now the, uh, the violation that he experienced made him go to the doctor. And when the doctor looked at him and said, but you already have what's. So it means that you have been engaging in this. So what makes it, what, what makes you think that we can take your word for it that you are violated? And this client didn't get treated, for example. So that it, it has taken away from this community and that doesn't address the issue of uh, masculinities in WPS. When we talk about peace and security, it's not just towards the women, it's, it's gender encompassing, that is, yeah. Okay, Sabrina, I want to say a few words and then I go back to Sarah. Yeah, very quickly, um, you know, there's a strong link between masculinity or this kind of violent masculinities and authoritarianism. And so what we need to think about is like at, at the societal level, um, there, there could be this idea that, that people are feeling emasculated because they're losing their jobs, the economy, you know, all kinds of reasons. And so there, that might make people want a strong, you know, I quote unquote, strong masculine authoritarian leader and what's dangerous is is exactly that link is that um you know these leaders will appeal to this emasculation to to then um you know provide the solution it, it as being a hyper masculine uh a solution essentially to everyone's problems um and then on the second point um one thing in the literature uh or or the way that that violence gets coded in um in a lot you know or, or reported is when there's men on men uh, sexual violence is often coded as torture. And so it doesn't even get counted as sexual violence. And, and so that's just something to be aware of is, is that we, we're not even using the language of sexual violence um, uh, when it comes to um, male on male violence. All right, Sarah? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so actually Sabrina, this one might come back to you, but everyone can jump in. Um, and I'll, again, I'll give you two at a time, but the first question is, how do panelists recommend engaging men without making them feel attacked or feel make them feel emasculated? That's one. And the other is, what do you hope for in the future of statelessness as more and more people are displaced or living as refugees? How does this affect peacekeeping and the role of masculinities within peacekeeping? Um, yeah, okay, so this is the, this is a big question because if you are going to do interventions with the security forces, um, you have to engage men all the time, um, and it's oftentimes men who don't believe or don't understand, um, you know, that, that sometimes the, the type of masculinity that they engage in can be harmful, um, and in fact believe that that masculinity is necessary for the creation of and cohesion of a security force. So how do you engage with them? Um, I, there's there's two things that I found um, to, that you know this is trial and error um, through the process of going through this um, the this assessment that we conduct with the security forces to understand women's uh, barriers to women's meaningful participation. Uh, 
because there's funding attached to it through the LC fund and UN women, you know, security forces are always, they always want funding. So, um, and, and goods that they can benefit from. Um, and so, but they have to undergo this assessment in order to be able to get those, you know, those goodies essentially. The assessment process itself has generated a lot of conversation exactly with the people that you would want. So there's mid-level leaders and all the leaders in the police forces or in the military, because they have to talk about, you know, parental leave policies as a part of the MOAT methodology, because they have to talk about sexual harassment policies. These are things that they would never be in a room and talk about otherwise, but the, the process kind of forces them to do that. And through that process, I've only gotten to witness it once because we only had uh, one presentation in one country before the pandemic, but it was just amazing to see the lights go off, go on in people's, um, you know, in particular men's um, views because they never heard their female colleagues talk about their experience before. And so um, getting pe the right people in the right room to talk about the issues in of itself can be very powerful um, as an intervention in of itself. Um, uh, I forgot what the second thing was, so I'll just, I'll just, I'll leave the statelessness question to, to Grace and others. Great, thank you. Grace, did you wanna talk about the statelessness question? Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to also touch a bit on the engaging men without emasculation. And I think one of the most important uh, things is uh, to have context uh, specific programming. A lot of the programming that we've seen around engaging men as champions and allies has been uh, programming that is uh, sort of replicated over the different contexts. And so what would specifically work, for example, in the Balkans wouldn't normally work in DRC Congo, for example. And so that uh, needs to be very context specific because then it will address the very specific issues uh, uh, in the context that that programming is being done. So when you talk about uh, statelessness and uh, what the future looks like in the context of WPS, I think it would be important to uh, not only recognize the fact that uh, when, when, we looked, when we talked about um, refugees and displacement uh, in the 90s, for example, a lot of the focus was on women and children as the victims. But now uh, we are shifting uh, and now we, we also see that men, as also, uh, men are victims. And this uh, is very uh, evident, for example, in the DRC, where men are not only forced to participate, for example, in rape, they also are forced to participate in violations of uh, other communities. And that has meant to demonize men as being the perpetrators of violence, for example, towards a different community that uh, where they were living um, in friendly terms before the conflict. So I think uh, it's important that we also begin to look at men and boys as victims and as uh, people who are affected by conflict. And most importantly, I think it would be important that at the point where people uh, trans, uh, trans uh, move from one country to another where they are seeking asylum, at, at the point of uh, asylum seeking, uh, addressing the very specific needs, especially uh, creating an environment that is enabling for even men to report uh, issues of sexual violations, because that has been the main issue in terms of addressing violence against men and especially sexual violence. In, in Kenya, for example, we see that a lot of the men who have been violated are very uh, shy to open up about the violations they have, they have faced in the country of origin. Uh, and during flight because of um, the stigma and the shaming that comes from their own community members, even from their own family members. So I think that is important when we talk about statelessness. But also we have to recognize that conflict is now becoming more protracted. So when we thought about um, Syria, for example, no one would thought it would have gone on for as long as it has. And so we need to recognize the fact that the people who are now getting displaced are living in asylum or in displacement longer than they were meant to be. And so we need to put programs in place that are not just addressing the emergency situation at that point, but uh, programs that uh, help these communities to get some sort of normalcy in terms of living a life where they can provide for themselves and restoring their dignity, even if it's not in a third country. You, <clears throat> I think um, we have to be very careful about language too. Uh, I think Philip Schultz, who's a, a scholar, has talked about the, the notion of emasculation as if this is, you know, 
permanently uh, robbing men of their manhood and that it leads to some kind of gender essentialization. And I think his point is very well taken. And I think when we use these words, we should be very careful. And I would actually want to propose that together with toxic masculinity, we should put these words in the cupboard and maybe uh, address these issues in a more nuanced way. I wanna go to Sarah for some last questions and then have a last round of comments from all of you and you can take in whatever question Sarah has tabled. Great, thank you. Um, yes, I have two more and we can see if some of these have already been kind of touched on. Um, so someone commented, it's in interesting about the comments about security forces and the focus on a hyper-masculine version to engage, um, for men to engage um, in war. Is there a compromise here or a level of this hyper-masculinity that we would want to keep in security efforts, particularly in conflict? And how does this affect women in the military? Again, these are always big questions. Um, and then the last, I think we've touched on some, um, is what successful policies or programming have you seen to address the more negative masculine traits of violence and expectations that are put on men and boys to behave in ways that are counterproductive in peacekeeping efforts? So I think some of you already spoke to some of those programming and policies that you've seen that maybe haven't been as effective, but if there are some examples of those that have been effective, um, it would be great to share those. And if we don't have time now, we can always share them out to our listeners in a later email. Okay. David, why don't you start us off? Yeah, I'll go to the, I, I guess, to the last question. But I think there are some examples of, of better programming. There's been some interesting work um, in, in Northern Uganda about men who've been affected by sexual violence that Philip Schultz has been involved with as well. I think that's really interesting work. I think I'm going to answer, try and answer the question as well about engaging men without them feeling attacked and in relation to this. So I would say when you're engaging men or you're wanting to have successful programs, what do you want to succeed? What actually do you want the outcome from that to be? Do you want men to shift some very specific practices? Do you want them to renegotiate their relationship with gender? Do you want to unmake patriarchy and reorder the gendered system? All these goals may not be compatible depending on what you're trying to achieve at a given moment. So if you want to do a program that works with men and says real men shouldn't use violence, well, you might work at shifting some men's violence in specific ways, but you're also working to reinforce the dominance of masculinity and rigid masculinity in that space. Very often, I think the programs have really suffered from a lack of clarity about what they want to actually achieve. They'll say we want to shift masculinities, unmake them, make them less violent, but never actually be very clear about what they think that's going to look like. In terms of being successful, I think there is a couple of good practices that Michael Flood has outlined in his survey of work on violence against um, women and girls and working with men. One would be to be clear about the community that you're working with. If you're working with perpetrators who are very hostile to work on gender, you need to shape your goals in that way. If you're working with a group of men who have said, you know, we're really struggling with our relationship with masculinity, we would like to stop being a sexist but we keep having these desires to live up to gendered expectations, you can probably try some of the group work that's more radical focused on consciousness raising or shifting their relationship with binary gender. You're probably not gonna get much success if you try and do that work with a group of military recruits who are trying to be in direct con conflict. So I would say there are some good examples. Again, I think Transcend Oceania is doing some interesting work in Fiji as well, um, getting trans women to come in to speak to men, getting women's organizations to come in and speak to men. I think there's some interesting initiatives, but I wouldn't probably propose that you do that if you're trying to run a program with special forces. That's a program which works because men in the community want to shift some aspects of their relationship with gender. That's a very different thing from trying to impose it externally. And as Grace said, this can't be replicatable globally. It has to be locally appropriate, designed for the context. You can't just pick up a program that was designed in New York and then go and apply it somewhere in the global South that has a totally different context. Thank you. I think we have, uh, what, one minute left. Sabrina and Grace. Sabrina. I'd like to just add to the question on the programs that have been effective in terms of uh, engaging men. And um, one comes to mind and that's the SASA model uh, that is 
It was first started uh, when addressing, uh, when doing programming for HIV AIDS, and it was looking at the connections between gender inequality, violence against women, and HIV. The, uh, so SASA model has been effective in terms of addressing the norms uh, that perpetrate violence and behavior change in the community. The only caveat I would put towards SASA is that, uh, as I said, it was started during the uh, HIV programming. And so when we talk about violence against women and uh, talking about engaging men, that has now shifted over the years. So we cannot continue to implement SASA as it is. It has to be very, it has, it has to be modeled to, to fit a certain context and uh, to fit certain issues in that specific context and community. Okay, Sabrina, last word to you. Yeah, very quickly, I, I, you know, this first question is, is really important because on one hand, security forces have to develop a certain kind of masculinity to do their job, but then the question is that same kind, you know, the paradox is that that same kind of, as some aspects of it then are also um, responsible for some of the excessive violence that happens. And so one point here is that there, things are very, identities are, can be institutionalized um, as, as both um, Grace and David have talked about, but they can also be triggered. So you can think of things like um, nationalistic videos or chants or uh, certain ritualistic practices or um, uh, hazing practices that stimulate more like, you know, different kinds of masculinities um, and different kinds of behaviors. There's a lot of things like that that are negative that, that take that identity too far. So while some parts of that identity are necessary, there are parts that are not necessary that are often triggered at, because there seem to be a necessity. So it's parsing out um, those differences. Um, and like I said, things can be triggered um, you know, if you watch uh, very uh, videos about babies and, and cute cats before you you go on patrol versus like watching a very nationalistic video, right? You're gonna have very different attitudes going into your patrol, for example. Um, and then just real quickly on successful policies, you know, like I said, it seems from our research that the the actual experience of peacekeeping missions can lead to changes in people's beliefs. And so I would advocate for more of the right type of experiences and right type of exchanges. Um, and I'm just speaking for security forces here um, that, that expose people to new ideas and new ways of doing things rather than just straight up um, gender trainings. Okay, we went a little over, but I think it was a very rich discussion. And I'd like to thank David, Grace, and Sabrina, also like to thank my colleagues, Sarah and Dikshita Ramnaya Ryan, uh, as well as our colleagues on the State Department side, Kayla McGill and Hannah Proctor. I think it is to be continued uh, because there's a lot more to discuss. And I hope that we can invite you for a next panel. Uh, meanwhile, thanks so much for your insight. I think we, we covered a lot, but there's a lot more to. Um, to discuss. So thank you.